The bank for central banks is blaring the siren on a new debt crisis that could cause a long and painful recession. The Bank for International Settlements, nicknamed the Bank for Central Bankers, said in a report that the ballooning levels of public and private debt are creating a trap that would be hard to escape. Although higher leverage can boost growth in the short run, it comes at the cost of deeper and longer recessions down the road, the BIS said in its 2018 annual economic report. It also identified specific pockets of the market that leverage has made vulnerable including the U.S. commercial real estate market. So let's take a look. Ten years after a credit crisis drowned the global economy, Central bankers are worried about debt. The Bank for International Settlements, dubbed the Bank for Central Bankers, said in its annual economic report for 2018 that the growing levels of government, corporate, and consumer borrowing created a debt trap. That policy may not be easily untangled down the road. Global debt across governments, non-financial corporations, and households surpassed $160 trillion at the end of 2017. The BIS placed some of the responsibilities at the feet of central bankers. It's true that low interest rates and other policies, some unconventional, helped many economies recover after the financial crisis. But therein lies the trap. Because growth and borrowing have become dependent on low rates, the economy and financial valuations are more sensitive to higher interest rates. This, in turn, makes it more difficult for central banks to raise rates, encouraging even more borrowing. The report noted that since the financial crisis, there has been a continuous rise of public and private debt relative to gross domestic product. Indeed, a growing body of studies documents how higher leverage in both the private and public sectors can boost growth in the short run, but at the cost of lower growth on average, including deeper and prolonged recessions in the future. The BIS looked into how the financial and business cycles interact with the growth of debt. In the good times, like now, leverage boosts asset prices and helps economies grow. However, everyone from households to companies has to face a payback reckoning that gets worse when the cycle turns. And it is evident by this chart that the downswings of the financial cycle, characterized by high debt service, deleveraging, and falling asset prices are closely associated with the economic downturns that have occurred in these countries since the mid-1980s, with some of these coinciding with very serious financial strains. The BIS further pinpointed a number of areas that are most at risk as debt levels rise. It prefaced that by noting that delicate pockets of the financial system exist even though the economy is still in an upswing. In the United States in particular, corporate leverage today is at its highest level since the beginning of the millennium. The BIS added that most investment-grade companies are vulnerable to being downgraded. The BIS also flagged U.S. commercial real estate where prices have recovered close to pre-crisis highs. Values there seem particularly vulnerable to rising long-term yields. Thirdly, the BIS noted the level of non-bank foreign currency borrowing in emerging market economies, which has doubled since 2008 and stands at $36 trillion. The growth rate of this debt almost tripled last year as the dollar weakened, but the economies are now exposed to a stronger dollar and a reversal of investors' appetite to take risk. While the global economy has made substantial progress post-crisis and near-term prospects are positive, the path ahead is a narrow one. The risks highlight the importance of taking advantage of the current upswing to implement the necessary measures to put the expansion on stronger footing and to rebuild policy buffers. And lastly, I wanted to bring to you a report on Micron Technology.
And this report came out the other day, and let me just read to you. It was titled, Now is the Time to Load Up on Micron Stock. And from the report, it reads, Micron's quarter was very, very good and exactly what the bulls needed to support the long-term bull thesis. Revenue growth was a whopping 40% headlined by 50% growth in the DRAM market. Gross margins expanded by roughly 13%, underscoring that the memory chip pricing environment remains exceptionally favorable. Operating margins expanded by more than 14%, illustrating management's ability to level expenses in the midst of a huge revenue growth. And the party isn't expected to stop next quarter either. Management is guiding for over 30% revenue growth, over 9% of gross margin expansion, and over 60% profit growth. In other words, the good times keep rolling. And then the report more or less ends with uh, the statement that Micron stock has a runway to $70 per share. And that may be true. But I'm going to disagree with the title again, which is now is the time to load up on Micron stock. And let me show you why. This is the 20 year monthly chart on Micron. And we see that the current price is $57.10 and it looks just dandy. But as you can see, for most of the time from, say, 2003 or so through 2013, it was pretty much dead money moving sideways. And then it did uh, start to pick up in 2013 through 2015, but then cycled back down to $10 a share. And then, of course, from 2016 to the current time frame, it's had a pretty good uh, rise up to the current price. So, in my opinion, for the most part, it really pretty much is dead money until we get uh, conditions like we have today. And I don't think that those conditions are going to last much longer. Let me show you why. Take a look here at the MACD. It looks like, yes, we are continuing to head on up in the fast line and the slow lane up to this level here of 10. If you go all the way back, though, the only time that we reached that point was just right before the dot-com bubble. So, that should be one warning flag. Moving on down here into the histogram, it looks like uh, we're pretty much uh, hit the highs here and we've gone sideways for uh, a couple of years or so. I don't see any impetus for this to increase, nor the price. Again, the uh, price is expected by the uh, report to increase to $70 a share, and that is always possible. But I don't think the probability is there. Moving here to the relative strength index, we see, in my opinion, it's starting to turn over, as it did perhaps in this time frame here, maybe in this little time frame here, perhaps in this time frame here. And then, of course, we had a peak in uh, the 2000 time frame right before the dot-com bubble. But in my mind, we've got a number of peaks there. So let's just take a look, closer look at those here into the stochastic, same sort of thing. We have uh, a rounding top peak, and I think it's heading down as it did here, perhaps in this little time frame there. And then, of course, back here in 2006 to 2007, right before the great financial crisis. So, in my opinion, it's starting to show similar characteristics to other times in the past where the stock price did head down. We definitely have a negative uh, divergence moving here, and certainly the curving over of, and the topping process in the Williams like that. Let's go ahead and take a look at here. Same sort of thing here with... Uh, that uh, uh, descending move here, and then, of course, the topping process in the Williams right before the great financial crisis. We had the topping process here, no real divergence in the bottom lines here. But uh, in my opinion, that is negative. Going on back up here to the price chart, I don't think uh, we're going to get much above 70 if we even get to that point. And for disclosure purposes, I do not own Micron technology at this time, and I don't uh, plan on any purchases in the future. So for Chew Dog Charts, thank you.